Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. After 40 days on the road, we have now returned to Green Valley, Arizona. It's a lovely day in the desert. Temperatures are very cool. It's 59 degrees this morning outside our front door. And uh, we just rejoice to have completed what God told us was the Come Up Higher Tour Amen. 2017. We prophesied over the cities where God sent us. We ministered to many. We made new connections, new friends, and just feel like God told us everywhere we went would be an apostolic center. Amen. One of the neat things about that was in Baltimore at Apostle Jean Donald's church, under the name of the church on her overhead graphic, it said an apostolic center. It's like the Lord is saying, let me spell that out for you. And so we uh, just really felt God moving in that. We went by, we, we drove. Initially, the invitation was to Baltimore, but then around that, we brought in uh, connections beginning in Dallas and then Oklahoma City, of course, in Branson. We ministered to a full house. And uh, then on to uh, Florida. We outran Harvey, we, out, we outran Irma, and uh, we went through Atlanta and uh, up to Sterling, Virginia, with Apostle Ricardo Watson. Had great meetings there. I actually have the videos for those meetings I'm going to be making available when time allows. And then on up to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Apostle Jonas Stolfus. And then in Nashville, just when we thought we were about winding it down, we had just a powerful meeting at Allison and Jeff Pearson's house. It was yeah. just such a God thing. Hello, Allison. <laughs> <laughs> we have had Allison on the new picture he posted on something on his Facebook recently. Last night, I think. We've had more than 250 um, likes or comments on it. It's amazing. You did a beautiful job on the photos. Thank you, Allison, for mm -hmm. that. So we're just uh, really elated that from the beginning to the end, uh, God was just moving on this, this road trip. Amen. Kitty calls it windshield time. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of that, we've been teaching out of the book of Daniel. And today, Daniel chapter 7 who is the little horn of Daniel 7? In Daniel 7, the prophet receives a vision that echoes the vision of Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2. It's almost like Daniel's version of Nebuchadnezzar's dream because they're like an overlay of each other. What Daniel experiences in chapter 7 just corresponds to what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed in chapter 2 that Daniel interpreted. And Daniel is shown four great world empires that encompass Babylon, the Medes and the Persians, Alexander the Great, and Rome. He also sees a little horn with a mouth speaking, which is really interesting because it's describing the timeline of human government down to our day. And it's just interesting that this leader, the little horn, that his strength is in his ability to communicate. Well, doesn't that make sense in an information age that Daniel also prophesied in a chapter we haven't studied yet, where he said that at that time, knowledge shall be increased. Well, he prophesied the information age. And in the information age, somebody with a great mouth is going to be somebody who will, will be prominent in that age. And so the, Daniel is just, it's got to be one of the most directly accurate prophetic books uh, in the scripture. Uh, 
so he sees this little mouth, this little horn with a mouth speaking great things who rises up and persecutes the people of God. And uh, there are uh, those who believe that the little horn was Nero. Remember, Daniel saw this almost 600 years mm -hmm. before Nero. Of course, Nero was the emperor during the birth of the church in the first century. Other people see figures like Hitler as a representation of the little horn. And back during World War II, if you go back and read what those who studied such things and preached such things back during, uh, from, say, 1938 on through the end of uh, World War II, they, there were many that deeply believed that Hitler was the Antichrist. And uh, others... Uh, Whatever the case may be, we're given in this chapter a prophetic timeline that speaks directly to the day that we are now living in. And so we're going to begin Daniel chapter 7. It's 28 verses. Kitty, if you would read verse 1 through verse 15, please. All right. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed, then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came, about, came up from the sea, diverse from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given unto it. And behold, another beast, a second, like a bear. And it raised itself up on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto, they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had... Uh, Upon the back of it, four wings of a fowl, the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong and exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from the beasts that were all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns." I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among uh, them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in the horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. And I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him. Then ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. And I beheld then, because of the voice of great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. And as concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season of time. I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I love that. Verse 13, I saw in the night, and behold, one like unto the Son of Man, who came in the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. That's just corresponding to 1 Corinthians, First Thessalonians chapter 4. It talks about Jesus coming in the clouds. And so chapter 7 opens with Daniel experiencing these visions at night, 
Now, there's a difference between a dream and a night vision. How can you tell the difference? Night visions speak to broad events in a corporate or, and often a national context. That's a night vision. Dreams are usually very personal, applying to the dreamer itself. You really do need to know the difference. Is this a night vision? It, in a night vision, God's usually going to talk to you about things that have nothing to do with you or anybody close to you. Dreams, however, are very personal. Job 33 says that God gives a dream to keep your foot from being taken in a snare and to hide you from pride. And the reason you need to know that is because many people will get a dream and try to correct somebody else. I've, how many times have I seen somebody get a dream and apply everything that the dream says to somebody else? God told me in a dream, this is going on with you. And then you hold that person hostage to something that you dream when the Bible does not say he gives you a dream to show you what's wrong with the other guy. It says he gives you a dream to hide you from pride and to keep your foot from being taken in a snare. But a night vision is totally different. Night visions are usually uh, received by those that are prophetic in nature, those that are called to the office of a prophet or those that are prophetic in nature or an intercessor uh, in terms of their placement in the body of Christ. And so as to the timing of this dream, it's given in retrospect to the previous chapter. Now, the events of the previous two chapters, actually, this chapter predates. Because in the previous chapter, we see Darius and the Medes and the Persians overthrew the Babylonians. In the chapter before that, Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, who inherited the kingdom from his father, Nebuchadnezzar, died. He saw the handwriting on the wall. And then we're back to the chapter before that while Belshazzar was still living. He had this dream in the first year of Belshazzar's life. So we're, we're going backward. That's very important because people read the prophets, particularly the prophetic books. If you try to read the, prof, the prophets in a linear fashion, you're not going to get the message. Mm -hmm. See, uh, in reading the apocalyptic books, it's important to remember that they are not linear in their narrative. We see this in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. If you remember, I kept digressing and saying, now this happened back previous to something else happening. You have to know it's not always important to know when it happened, but where it is stated, you need to pay attention. Because the things that the, it's like Revelation, is Revelation linear? It really isn't linear. Re the book of Revelation is a layered book, and it's multidimensional as well. I don't mean Buckaroo Banzai in the eighth dimension. <laughs> I'm talking about there's different aspects of Revelation. There is a reading of Revelation that's all about something on the inside of you. Because you see the 24 elders and you have 24 ribs. And see the four living creatures, your 24 ribs surround a heart that has four chambers. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is enthroned on your heart and the Lamb is on the throne in the book of Revelation. So there's a reading of the book of Revelation that is entirely internal. And will absolutely send you off like a Roman candle mm -hmm. of fireworks when you begin to see all of that stuff rumbling around on the inside of you. And... You say, well, does that exclude a linear, apocalyptic, uh, eschatological perspective on Revelation? You know, which is it? Is it personal or is it eschatological or dispensational? The answer <laughs> is yes. It's all of those things. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so you have to get this and understand the, the uh, different lenses through which you can read the prophets like when the scripture talks about he that sits, and that's in our next chapter, as a matter of fact, he that sits in the temple declaring himself to be God, the abomination of desolation spoken of. Jesus quoted it, and I was reading it this morning in Matthew 24. Well, let me tell you something. There's something on the inside of you that can sit in the throne of your heart declaring himself to be in charge, <laughs> and that's an abomination of desolation in your temple, as well as speaking eschatologically and dispensationally as to the timeline of God. And many people who aren't motivated to study the scripture, I mean, they're doing good to 
stay awake during a Sunday school lesson, they throw up their hands, oh, psh, we don't want to get away from me with that. Yeah. Why? But if we were teaching them how to win the lot, win a $10 million lottery, money back guaranteed, they would come with their notebooks, their syllabus, two recording devices, a video camera, and they would get people that we need to get this down. And you would apply yourself. That person would apply themselves to uh, multi-dimensional complex algorithms, <laughs> you know, because the See, sometimes you know your our our perspective of the complexity of what we're learning belies our motivation. If you hear what I'm saying, and because of the sporadic way that the timing is addressed in these books, uh, it does make them difficult to decipher. When you realize, as well, on top of the fact that they're not linear in their testimony, they're dealing with future events. And so you have to, it's like, who's on third base? You have to pay attention. <laughs> so Daniel dreams and he sees four winds. And what are the winds? The winds are spirits. It's four kingdoms in the natural that come forth after he sees the four winds. So the first thing that he sees is in the spirit. Can you close your eyes and look in the spirit at the winds that are blowing on the earth today? There are winds that are blowing, people. And the first thing God shows Daniel is what it looks like from being seated with Christ in heavenly places. If all you see, we saw, we saw a manifestation of something in Las Vegas this morning in this worst mass shooting in the history of the United States. Well, that's what emerged on the earth, but can you see the wind that's blowing behind it? And so the first thing Daniel sees is the winds, and they're blowing on the sea. We see the winds are blow of the spirit, of the spiritual winds. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. Spiritual winds are blowing on the sea of humanity, and one of those winds created a white cap in the sea of humanity that caused a man to take an automatic rifle and turn it on a crowd of 22,000 people. And it's important for you to understand the wind because man does not look beyond the natural. But you can't solve the problem on the level of the problem. As believers, we have to look from a perspective of being seated with Christ in heavenly places. Amen. So the four winds, they represent four princes. Remember the prince of Persia that was resisting Daniel? We haven't read about that yet. Mm -hmm. That the angel came and the, he said, look, I'd have been here sooner. But the prince of Persia, who was the prince? He was the one of these four winds that was blowing. We really need to get that. And what are the four kingdoms? They are Babylon. Remember the king's dream in Daniel 2. Babylon, the head of gold, the Medes and the Persians, the arms of silver, Alexander the Great, the belly of brass, and Rome, the legs of iron. And now people interpret this and they say the four kingdoms of the image, dream of the image in Daniel 2. But in reality, there are five demonstrations of human government because, yes, it's legs of iron, but it's feet of iron and clay. And so that's very important because if you just look at that and people, because they look at, at it as only four kingdoms and the fourth kingdom is the one of the legs and feet of iron, they ignore the toes of clay and they try to extrapolate some clandestine conspiracy, Illuminati, something going on that, that the ancient Roman Empire is still trying to dominate us. And I'm not saying there aren't influences, but what I am saying to you that we have to look and let the vision speak to us. And it's something we'll be talking more about, and we've talked about this in our teaching on Daniel 2. You should go back and listen to that if you're, you're curious. So as Daniel watches this dream, he sees the four winds, and then the four winds give way to four beasts that come up out of the sea of humanity, which these also represent these four kingdoms. The lion is the kingdom of Babylon. The bear he then sees is the Medes and the Persians. The leopard is Alexander the Great. The beast with the iron teeth is Rome. So, in verse 4, we see the lion kingdom is described. The lion kingdom, and we're not talking about the lion king, hello. <laughs> Remember it said he, a lion with eagle's wings in verse 4, and it said there, 
was given to him a man's heart. See, from Daniel's perspective, he only knew Belshazzar for a very short time. Belshazzar was the son who succeeded Nebuchadnezzar, but he knew Nebuchadnezzar very well. And so God showed him the lion kingdom to Daniel. That's Nebuchadnezzar. And he was lifted up. The scripture says that he was lifted up from the earth. Remember his arrogance. Mm -hmm. Look what I have done. But then he ate grass for seven years and was humbled and was given the heart of a man, a heart of humility. That's, Daniel would have instantly recognized the lion as being the heart of uh, what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Question? And uh, so this was fulfilled in Daniel 4, when Nebuchadnezzar was made to grovel like an animal, after which he humbles himself, admitting, despite all the glory of his kingdom, he's only a man. Now, in verse 5, what about the bear that raises itself up on one side and has three ribs in his mouth. That's the Medes and the Persians. Because remember, it's the Medes and the Persians. It was a, um, uh, a confederacy. It was what they call the Medo-Persian alliance. But the Medes did not become great in themselves. It was the Persian side of that alliance that became great and became a world empire. They were always connected to the Medes, but the Medes were not the ones that drove the militaristic conquest that overthrew the known world. So it was the bear raising himself up on one side, the Persian side of what he represented, and then Darius becomes the Persian uh, ruler of of the world. Now, what about the three ribs? There's Persia is the bear, and the three ribs represent that if you know history, of course, you know, history is where you fall asleep in class. <laughs> if you understand the, the history of Persia, there were three great conquests of the Persian Empire. The great Military defeats brought about by Persia represent the three ribs, Egypt, Babylon, and Lydia. And so Daniel sees that, <clears throat> and God is showing him that the Persians are going to come, and they're going to end that the Persians will have three great conquests, Egypt, Babylon, and Lydia. And then the leopard is Alexander the Great. This is very interesting because when Alexander the Great, who hasn't showed up yet, when he overthrows Judah and goes to Jerusalem, he, he went to Jerusalem. It's a known fact that he went to Jerusalem and he met with the high priest. And when he met with the high priest, they showed him the book of Daniel because they believed he was the leopard with the four wings. And guess what? Alexander believed it too. And you remember that this, this uh, uh, leopard has four heads? Because when Alexander died, his instructions were that his kingdom be divided among his four generals. And here they showed this to Alexander before it came to pass, he read the book of Daniel, he believed that he was that leopard, and he went out and did what the vision said. <laughs> Isn't that powerful? He took that as a personal prophecy. People want to say, well, where's personal prophecy in the Bible? Right here. It's just like when the prophet cried out, the unknown prophet that prophesied against the altar at Bethel, and he said, God's going to raise up a king, Josiah by name, and he's going to destroy the altar at Bethel. And then 300 years later, the temple's in disarray and the boy king, Josiah, tells them, you need to clean this mess up. I'm king now. Mm -hmm. And when they're cleaning the temple up, they find an antiquated, obscure scroll that they start reading to the king. And I'm going to raise up a king, Josiah by name. And all of a sudden, Josiah pricks up his ears and he goes out and he does everything that the scroll said. He found himself. Josiah found himself <laughs> in the narrative. And... Alexander found himself in the narrative. And so, which is more important, finding yourself in the narrative? How about finding the narrative in yourself? <laughs> That's, good. That's good, honey. <laughs>
And so Alexander's empire, after he died, um, let me see, let me read it now. I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> getting excited. Here with you. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm, I saw something and I was actually referencing chapter 8, so I can't go there yet. We'll do that tomorrow. And so Alexander dies. The leopard has four heads. Alexander's kingdom is divided between four generals. And this particular, verse 5, I'm sorry, verse, it's actually verse 6. Verse 6, where it talks about Alexander's rule, this is the one verse that critics of the Bible will point to and say the Bible is a fallacious book and it's just something that's been manufactured by man, not because it's inaccurate, but because it's too accurate. <laughs> and even evangelical scholars and seminarians are taught that this is an example of a book that claimed to be written in the 6th century before Christ when, when it was actually had to be written in the 150 years before Jesus because it's too accurate in describing. There's no way they, they just... And they, they don't say, we don't believe in prophecy. What they say is, scholarship has revealed. The scholarship is their unbelief. And even seminarians and evangelical scholars will throw that garbage at you and put the DDD behind their name and say, and my, my erudite scholarship ma makes me the authority and not you. But all what they're doing is they're wrapping that up just to hide their rank unbelief. And then we come to the fourth beast in this prophetic timeline. This is the point where when we read about, if you want to know where we're at in God's timetable, we're somewhere between Daniel 7.7 7 and Daniel 7.8. That's where we are. And uh, it, we, the challenge for us in the prophecies of Daniel is to identify the point where events have already transpired and those which have yet to occur. In so doing, we locate ourselves in the plan of God with respect to the nations. The fourth beast is a beast with iron teeth. It represents Rome. Now, I want you to really listen now because I'm going to say some things that isn't necessarily what everybody else says about this. The ten horns, remember the fourth beast has ten horns. The ten horns it possesses and the little horn that comes up after are a matter for great conjecture. Everybody's got a different viewpoint on this. Some hold that the ten horns were the ten Caesars from Julius to Vespian. And that the little horn was Nero. The three horns that the Nero horn would have supplanted are the three Caesars who lived and died during Nero's lifetime, but before he became emperor. In other words, in his lifetime, before he became emperor, there were three Caesars that lived and died, and then Nero. So his, as a little horn, supplanted three horns or Caesars that lived and died during his lifetime. Frankly, I find that compelling. I, I really do. Uh, on the other hand, if you contend that the ten horns point to our time, many believe that the ten horns were originally, when I was younger, were the ten nations of the European common market, the EU. But now we have... I think last time I checked, 26 nations, and that's changing because nations are dropping out of the EU. Uh, but uh, back then they would say, I remember the, the prophecy preachers would come and, and there were eight nations. There's only two more nations to come in the EU before the Antichrist comes. And it was like, max out your credit cards, leave your bills to the Antichrist. There's about to be 10 nations in the EU. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But then what do you do when we have 26 nations or whatever it was the last time I checked, it was a lot more than that. But just, again, you don't want to be too much of a skeptic or scorn them because we're all looking through a glass darkly. Uh, but if the 10 horns were 10, let's say 10 dominant nations, because if I believed this is the EU it's, it's indicating, 
than I would say 10 dominant nations, not just 10 member nations of the EU common market. That would be supplanted by a little horn nation. Three of them would be supplanted by a little horn nation. And that's interesting because then they go on and say that the Antichrist will dominate the world, but even in their 10 horn common market uh, definition, he only dominates three horns or three nations. You got to think about this stuff. Which of these conjectures is accurate? Has the beast with the iron teeth come and gone with Nero and the fall of Rome? Or is this pointing to a future time? Which is it? And you get people who say it's already all come to pass, and they're called preterists. Preterists. Uh, and they believe that all of the Bible prophecy has all come to pass. None of it applies to us. And then we have those that are dispensationalists that say, no, most of this has not come to pass yet. And how are we supposed to look at this? Well, one of the here is a mature way of looking at this, and it's reflected in something John said in 1 John 4, 3. He said, every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist. Do you have a spouse who does not confess that Jesus is the Christ? Well, guess what? He's the Antichrist. Do you have kids who do not confess that Jesus is the Christ? That's the spirit of Antichrist is working in them. Do you have a city that refuses to acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ? I love these African nations that get up and pronounce, I declare some president, I don't remember what nation it was, I think it was Uganda, uh, he said, I declare that Jesus Christ is Lord over Uganda or whatever nation it was. I'm like, yeah, I'd vote for that guy, you know. But yet we see secularism disparages and discourages and minimalizes those kind of statements. That tells me that whatever secularism was intended to be in order to protect our right to worship as we please, it has become an antichrist for us. See? The Antichrist, he says, you have heard that the Antichrist would come. He, and John is saying, I got news for you. He's already in the world. Mm -hmm. So it, is it past? Yes, it is, because Antichrist was in the world. Look up Antioch, Antiochus Epiphanes. Look up uh, the different, uh, look at Hitler. Look at different ones. And you'll see the Antichrist spirit working. Where we get into trouble is we, we make exclusive extrapolations that Hitler had to be the Antichrist. Yeah, wait a minute, because what happened after Hitler doesn't fit the narrative that the scripture reveals. What happened after Nero, he fulfilled probably more accurately than any other the little horn prophecy, but what happened after Nero doesn't fit the narrative. That, And we're going to read more of that in just a moment. So there are many Antichrists that have foreshadowed the Antichrist that is to come. For instance, when verse 8 tells us that the little horn is given a mouth, speaking great things, do we have some people on the world scene that have a mouth speaking great things? No. <laughs> we could certainly point to Hitler. He's dead now, so that's a safe bet. And this man, through his ability, through great oratory, he deceived a nation and plunged the world into the most devastating conflict we've had in human history. Nero was an antichrist, as Hitler was likewise an antichrist, both foreshadowing an antichrist to come who will be characterized by his immense communication skills. And only in the information age, since the information age has communication skills, become a major factor and people rising up to influence the world. Before the information age, it was not your ability to give a speech, but your ability, your skill at arms. How good of a warrior were you? How, could, how good of a general to command troops were you? It was military might and personal martial skills that could cause you to be propelled to greatness. But now, in the information age, it's the ability of a leader to establish and control a narrative that holds sway over the nations. So the Antichrist, we may conclude, 
will be an outspoken populist Western leader. And in fact, this ideal, here's the setup for the Antichrist, this ideal for leadership that leaders now, since the days of Ronald Reagan, leadership now is not based on political ideology, but it has been populist leaders that have risen to the top and dominated the world. And you can see this in U.S. politics. Reagan was a populist. He began as a Democrat. He became a Republican. What was he? When they do that, they're a populist. The president we have now, he was a Democrat for decades. Then he became a Republican. And and you look at him, he's a populist. You don't see him as an ideologue, which is why he's angering uh, the Republicans, because he's talking to the Democrats. Why? Because he's a populist. We need to think about this. Bill Clinton, he was a populist. I remember how the, his own party was just mad at him because he was doing things with the conservatives that they didn't like. Because it is populist leaders, and it's setting up humanity to accept a populist leader who's going to have a great mouth speaking things so compellingly, but against God that people are going to swallow it hook, line, and sinker. When Bill Clinton was doing the things that he did and the sexual proclivities that he had, the Democrats were saying, character has nothing to do with leadership. Look what he did. He paid off the national debt. When the president we have now, on tape, saying the most ribald, vulgar things of his sexual prowess and all of this, and the Republicans were then saying what the Democrats said about Bill Clinton. Character has nothing to do with it. The question is, can he help the nation? And even Christians have got on board with that. Does that impeach our president, whether or not he's going to be a leader that's going to do good for the country? No, it doesn't say anything about our president. It says something about the believers who whitewash the character of a man so unswervingly ungodly in his personal character and they say Christian leaders say well it doesn't matter it's what he's going to do for the nation and you can't unring that bell he's our president and I'm not suggesting that we would want to because the scripture tells us when God put, puts one in office it's by his hand and not by man's right. but we have to what we do have to see is the framework of populism in an information age where whoever has, has greatest control of the narrative can dominate the world, which is exactly what this describes in terms of the Antichrist. So, in verse 9, we see the Antichrist figure will be in power when Jesus, as the Ancient of Days, comes and sits and brings all the nations under his rule for a thousand years of peace. And at this time, the beast and the little horn will be slain and destroyed by the flames of God's judgment. And in the aftermath of this upheaval, the kingdom of God and the dominion of God will be set up that it says will not pass away. If you uh, conclude the chapter, please. Okay. Verse 16. I came near unto one of them that stood by, and I asked him, of the, asked him the truth of all this. So he told me, and he made known the interpretation of things. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom. I love that verse. And possess the kingdom forever. Who's going to take the kingdom? The saints of the Most High. Woo-hoo! So we're going to take something. And possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the four beasts, which was diverse from all others, exceedingly dreadful, and whose teeth were of iron, his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. Then the, And the ten horns that were in his head, and of the others which came up, and before whom three fell, even that of the horn that had eyes, and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more than more stout than his fellows. And behold, I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints. We know about warfare and prevailed against them until until the Ancient of Days came <laughs> and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. 
Thus he said, The four beasts shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, who and shall devour the whole earth, and shall dread it, tread it down, and break it in pieces. And the ten horns of the kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given unto his hand until a time, and a times, and the dividing of time. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion, to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion, and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven, shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and dominion shall serve and obey him. Hither unto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cog, cog, cognitations, cogitations. Sorry. Cogitations, sorry, much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. So Daniel experiences the four great beasts, this vision, and he approaches an angel, and the angel says, yes, these are the four great kings that will arise out of the earth, but that the saints shall usurp, the saints shall possess. See, the Ancient of Days comes, and then the saints possess. Okay, so it's like Jesus is going to come, and we think we're all going to be gone from here. He says, wait a minute, would you go repossess this for me? Hello. He's going to ask us to be a repo man. He's going to give us the key to a tow truck, what and we're going to go repossess the kingdom. Yeah, what city are you living in? So whatever ha happens, however your understanding of 1 Thessalonians 4 is about what happens, call it the rapture, call it whatever you want. But whatever it is, it's the ancient of days coming, the disposition of the saints is changed, and whatever takes place from that point, it falls under the descriptor of the saints possessing the kingdom. Amen. And you have to ask yourself, if that doesn't fit your eschatology, then maybe you should do like the Jews did after the resurrection of Jesus. They decided Daniel did not belong in their canon. Mm -hmm. And if you ask a, a observant Jew today, he'll say, no, Daniel is not a prophet. Can you believe it? The most accurate book of the prophetic, and the Jews don't even accept him as a prophet, because if they do, they have to accept Jesus. That's right. And they do. So Daniel asked further about the fourth beast and the little horn. And instead of an example, he's shown a further vision of the little horn warring against the saints and prevailing against them for a time until God himself as the ancient of days comes and the saints are given judgment and rule over all the earth. Now the fourth beast and its description in verse 23 and 24 is not inconsistent with the rise of the Roman Empire because did not... The Roman Empire get handed to the saints in the 3rd century when Constantine declares Christianity to be the only legitimate religion of the world empire of Rome. You have to, That's compelling to me. Am I saying it's all come to pass? No, I believe there's some things yet to come. But I see a pattern. I see a template. Some people, I've had... People I've talked to that suggest that prophecy comes to pass in a cyclical manner and that, it, that a cycle, what, what the Mayans call the long count calendar, that a cycle is completed and then it starts over again. Well, there may be some legitimacy to that, not to what the Mayans believe, but to that way of thinking because so much of this does fit, but yet there are parts of it that did not fit because when the church, now the Roman Catholic Church believes that and they believe that in the Middle Ages. Yes, we're ruling, we're us. The, the Roman Empire is us. We are the Roman Empire and we have fulfilled Daniel 7. But then they, they didn't because they didn't rule in righteousness, did they? No, they had the Spanish Inquisition and other things. And so when we study this, we just have to stop and, and think. We have to look at this. When we look at this timeline, of course, you look at the timeline between the leopard beast and the beast with the iron teeth as something that began to come to pass with the rise of the Roman Empire, but has not been fully fulfilled because there are things that come after that do not describe what came after that are not matching up with what Daniel 7 talks about. And so there was fulfillment, but there is further fulfillment. And most prophecy, if you really pay attention, 
Most prophecy has three levels of fulfillment. There are things that happen immediately, things that happen in an intermediate manner, like a process, and then there's a culmination. And if you study prophecy, you'll see that that's true. And so we can look closely at this little horn as an antichrist figure and bear in mind that uh, the vision of this chapter does not address. The one thing it leaves out of what Daniel's seeing is the feet of clay and iron. That's totally, that's t completely absent from this. And so you got to think, and the feet of clay and iron describe the geopolitical landscape as we know it today of two types of government. Totalitarian government, those are toes of iron, and clay government, which clay represents human flesh. He's the potter, we're the clay. Government that is based on representative rule. In other words, we vote, we have legislature, and, and democratic principles rule. Those are the feet and toes of, of clay and iron in the vision of the king or the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. And none of this points to that. And so we have to stop and think about that. But we know that whatever be the case, that during the time or the season of feet of clay and iron, which represents the political landscape for the last several centuries in modern history, that is the time when, according to Daniel 2, the rock cut out of the mountain is going to strike the image at its feet, and the mountain of the Lord's house will then obliterate the image of man's government, and the kingdom of God will be established forever and ever. And S Something to look forward to. There's a lot of questions there. <laughs> But let me tell you something. I'm more comfortable with my questions than I am with everybody else's pat answers. And I just know, like uh, Ern Baxter uh, said when he preached on the kingdom of God at the Charismatic uh, World Convention in Kansas City back in the 70s, he said, and let me just sum it up for you. He's preaching on the kingdom. He says, let me sum it up for you. And he flipped his Bible to the back. He said, I looked in the back of the book and we win. <laughs> Made it simple. And so in the end, that's what we have to know. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for our lesson today in Daniel. Thank you that it stirs our faith. It stirs our hope. It gives us courage, Father. We don't want to just uh, look to the end. We want to we want to be faithful stewards of what you've given us in our now, that every day is valuable to you. And so, Father, help us in our determination to let your kingdom come in our earth that wherever we live and wherever we reside wherever we work father that you can make a difference where we are because of christ in us the hope of glory in jesus name we pray amen